hello, my name is Christabel and welcome to Eco Resolution. We are an environmental justice platform aiming to enable and support people in stepping up rather than shutting down in the face of the climate and ecological crisis. As you all probably know, current global systems aren't serving the people or the planet and they're just driving ecological breakdown and social injustice and many other things. <laughs> but our mission <laughs> is, is to educate and empower people around the world to take action, to mobilize their communities and to come together to start co-creating different cultures and ways of being in the world to allow um, more flourishing, more thriving of, um, of themselves and of their surroundings. So as part of our 10 month learning journey that we've been doing this year in 2020, we are now exploring NVDA, which means nonviolent direct action. And I'm so happy to be joined by Vishal, um, who's gonna be discussing this with me. And also we're gonna be expanding our vision a little bit beyond maybe what is classically understood within nonviolent direct action to explore something called participatory democracy. Participatory democracy, I think you can also say participatory. I can't say the word. <laughs> I struggle every time as well. <laughs> um, so welcome, Michelle. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so to start off, can you tell me a little bit about um, how you came to NVDA and participatory democracy? Um, and yeah, just a little bit about yourself. No, you know enough about me. I think you should do the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I was working as a doctor, I was working in A&E for about a year, worked as a doctor for about three years, I was working in A&E and um, got tired of mopping up the pieces of a failed society, you know, like I'd be in hospital looking after someone every single day in A&E, like I'd treat someone who had attempted to take their life by suicide. And it's just heartbreaking because you're like, it's just a revolving door. They come in, you make sure they are unsuccessful at their attempt, um, i.e. save their life, and then send them back out into the world. And it was just like, crap, because you think the interventions that that person needs are like 10 years ago or like way earlier when they had a calling for purpose and meaning that wasn't being met in society or for care and affection and attention or connection, whatever it is, and it wasn't met. And then that's led to this spiral. Um, and same things with like end stage diabetes, respiratory illnesses, all sorts of things that you're just like, wow, this is the end of the road. And that's not what I was about. And so I started exploring how to create environments that were conducive to our flourishing like physically mentally emotionally socially whatever um i wanted to set up the what's it called the the center for the flourishment of human potential <laughs> i love that <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um rolls um, off the tongue yeah, yeah 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 it's great um and so like i started looking into mindfulness permaculture all sorts of different things and that led me to wanting to run mindfulness courses for activists. I've been an activist before I became a doctor and whilst being a doctor, um, but I was a bit scared about how to get back involved with activism. So I thought, let me just support um, activists with their mental health through mindfulness. And I basically got sent to Extinction Rebellion, told to, um, that they would be interested and went to a couple of meetings and before I knew it, I was in the wellbeing team with a long-term wellbeing and resilience team, which is where I met you, um, which was great. <laughs> um, I remember first talking to you on the, on the phone actually and being like, oh my God, this person would be amazing. How are we gonna make sure that we don't look like crazy people and you wanna get involved? I had no idea who you were. You wrote really me in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just really funny that I was really intimidated to speak to you. Oh. Um, but yeah, Still anyway. now? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I got involved with XR, Extinction Rebellion, and mainly only to support the well-being of these activists. I wasn't interested in what they were doing, and I thought Extinction was a bit extreme, and getting arrested was a bit extreme. Uh, but as I started to engage and pay attention, it, I started to 
believe that NVDA and Extinction Rebellion's approach um, of creating a mass movement of people engaging in civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action was a great approach and would, I guess the consideration I was making was I could go and make my center for, crap, I've forgotten the name of it, uh, Center for the Flourishment of Human Potential. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Um, and I could go and do that, but what I want is a mass subsidized program and a cultural shift in consciousness whereby every young person with that inkling is supported and encouraged to make thousands of them. And I mean, my friends are saying like, we're going for the big win with this one and we can go and do it selfishly with our own privilege or we can make it the infrastructure of our society. And so that got me, that's how I got there. Is that enough? Yeah, that's great. That's great. So, so yes, yeah, so you were working with Extinction Rebellion and working within regenerative culture building and that's mm. how we met and we're working together throughout some of the rebellions, which was a mm. pleasure. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about participatory democracy and um, what that means to you and why it's something that we should all be kind of understanding a little better. Yeah, I guess like, um, I'm gonna say things probably like a little less balanced than how I understand it because it might just be easier. So that might make me come across as a little bit like bigoted or something, but I think it'll be useful for the conversation. Okay. Um, so I think like, So participatory democracy is a form of democracy that like challenges the current facade of democracy um, that we have. So the current form of democracy we have is not one where we participate in decision making. We participate in a vote once every five years to nominate someone else to have decision making power over our lives. And the idea behind that is we can go ahead and get on with our gardening and whatever like um, self-liberating activities and consciousness shifting activities we get up to and allow the logistics of our life to be governed by this person we voted for. In reality, it means we can get on with going to work and serving the neoliberal capitalist industrial fuckery um, and enslave ourselves and let someone else make decisions about our lives on top of that. So as you can see, I'm not a fan of non-participatory democracy. <laughs> um, so participatory democracy is about like people, decision-making being devolved to the most local level possible. So for example, if I want to make a decision about the grassy verges on my street, the people on my street should come together and participate and be empowered to make decisions about the grassy verges on their street. Um, but decisions about the, like, I don't know, electricity and plumbing network might happen at a, like a kind of local level, like a kind of council level. And then decisions about our, um, I don't know, overall energy network or um, how many migrants we let into the country or something will happen at a nationwide level or something like that. But essentially people are way more empowered to make decisions and that makes us way more um, leaderful, empowered, like, I mean, I could say empowered like 20 times because it's so important. Mm. Like we want to feel empowered and empowered is important because it's not about being empowered to make decisions working in a call center trying to sell insurance, something you do not give a fuck about and is so disconnected to your day-to-day -day survival and existence. It's participating in decisions that determine your environment and your life, like the grassy verges on your street. <laughs> and the idea is that when you give people responsibility, people will act responsibly, or when you trust people, they become trustworthy. And our current system is based on distrust, um, hierarchies of power, patriarchy, um, competition. It's a very like, masculine dominating political system and economic system. Participatory democracy has like three main principles. If you use the municipalist model, which is a model, don't worry about it. Um, and that is the feminization of politics. Um, fuck, what are they? Proximity 
and uh, something else which is really powerful and important, but it doesn't matter. So the two important ones are proximity and trust. Uh, not trust, proximity and feminization of politics. So proximity is the gap between the person with power and the person without power is really small. So right now it's massive. The difference between you and the politician who represents you is massive. Um, yeah, it's massive. Um, and that means they can get away with stuff, you know, they become more powerful, more important than the people. And feminization of politics is like, The best example I've heard by um, like a mentor, Jamie Kelsey Fry, um, is um, yeah, someone called Manuela Carmena, who is a mayoress of um, Spain. And she was elected through participatory democracy. So these assemblies where people would gather and everyone would be equal. They would discuss issues. They would listen to each other. Um, oh, that's it. Collaboration. That's the third one. Let me write that <laughs> down before I forget. Um, and she was elected by this this people's kind of vote or whatever and this people's movement and she would participate one of the, the policies was that councillors and people and the mayoress themselves had to participate in, I think like one or two people's assemblies like every week or every month or something like that anyway she's at this like meeting with all her other councillors and they're discussing I think uber and what to do about uber and everyone, like one by one, they're in a circle, one by one, everyone gives their view. Yeah, we should, like Uber's great, or oh no, it's tyranny over our people, and we should do this, and we should do that. Um, and they're like, you know, giving their views. And you get to Manuela Carmena, and they go, so, mayoress, what do you think? You know, you're the mayor, uh, you should know. You know what, what, what do you think? And she just paused and said, I don't know, and neither do you. We've just wasted an hour of our time, you making up these like ideas just to exert dominance and power over people. Um, but what we need to do is speak to experts and um, do some research and find out from stakeholders, get like a 360 degree view of the situation and see what needs to be done. And for me, that like really epitomizes like one aspect of the feminization of politics. You know, it's like humility not knowing being okay. Um, it's about care and consideration within the environment and not being competitive. And collaboration and confluence, you know, that's so removed that you look at these monkeys like arguing each other in the houses of parliament, just trying to keep hold of power mm. when we need to be going to a system which is deeply collaborative. Yeah. Now, if from the decision-making for our grassy verges, all the way up to national security policy. We have uh, people empowered to make decisions. They're working together. Um, and it's similar to like, you know, the citizen assembly approach, but just like rather than citizen assembly being another top down approach, it's like citizens assemblies at a very local level. Yeah. Um, and the reason I mentioned grassy verges is it's, given the crisis if people had the choice every grassy verge would be a wildflower meadow yeah but decision making isn't given to people and they can't those ideas can't enter our frameworks so the decisions are hidden away somewhere so it's quite yeah. hard it's really interesting and it's it's i find it surprising that like the concept of democracy and discussions around democracy aren't something that I've really engaged with that much in the past apart from a workshop that I went to with you um, on mm. it um, and also a little bit with um, Jamie Bartlett uh, on an event we did about like big data and, and, the, and the effect that has on democracy but mm. I feel like because I live in like a democratic <laughs> quote um society um i've kind of assumed that that i understand what democracy is because i've, I've assumed that i live it and that that is what democracy mm. is and i never really understood that actually we we have a, a version of democracy a very watered down version of democracy and then i think the other thing to mention is that i've also felt very privileged to live in a democratic society because relatively speaking to a lot of um a lot of the world we have a lot of democratic privileges that aren't shared with um, a lot of other nations. So 
But nevertheless, when you actually come to understand what democracy is meant to be and, and how profound and expansive and liberating democracy can be, you start mm. to realize what a poor version we have of it. And um, I think it was in the enlightenment that the kind of concept of uh, democracy arose because it was this idea that people should be free from coercion of power of the like of a small um, group of people who have power so it was talking about the church and the feudal system and it kind of feels like we no longer live in those structures but of course we do because we have the corporations and so before you spoke about the proximity between me and, and the prime minister but also I mean even further than that is the proximity between me and corporations these global mm. um, corporations that that are that there's not even a figurehead to them um, and mm. they have such a power over uh, over our governments who are then kind of these like democratic figureheads and yet we have no like it's just it's very um, it's, it can feel very overwhelming and I think we're now pushed to such a place of passivity or well, not we're pushed to but because we don't need to be pushed to but we have been led to this place of passivity and apathy whereby we don't we we're so overwhelmed I think by life mm. and so mm. confused by the complexity of politics and actually how we can have a say and not really knowing how our actions can make a difference um, something I've also been thinking about recently is how you know, the globalized issue of climate change and capitalism and, um, and ecological breakdown. That's such a huge, huge thing that I think that if it was more manageable, I think it would be more on people's minds and more in discussions But because it's so big. Um, it's too overwhelming that people just can't really address yeah. it properly in any real way because it's too, it's too complex. Um, but what I love about participatory democracy is the kind of localization of decision making, the coming together of yeah, community, yeah, yeah. the increasing of um, representation, of, of having more diverse, um, uh, more diverse uh, representation of different cultures that live within a community and being able to share different opinions because what's happening now is that we're so fragmented and that the mm. media kind of it's just obviously polarizing us even more to the point where it's almost like there is no discussion or debate anymore um and and it's just more like one really extreme view versus another really extreme view and like you were saying the other day you know with the decline of the commons we have no like opportunity to really have those discussions and and kind of find out what our neighbors care about and what they would be wanting to see in our in our like local communities yeah 100 percent, and like um my friend Julian Davy like talks about how like yeah our mm, our work is really just to learn how to work in teams together um and it's as simple as that and for as long as these divisions between communities and between identities and cultures who are neighbors in the same neighborhood, but these divisions exist, we will defer decision-making to someone higher than us. Mm -hmm. um, whereas participatory democracy is about, like William Frank says, um, about healing the divisions in our fragmented society. It's about using conversation, facilitated community circles, dialogue, these principles of deep listening, um, uh, trust, collaboration, feminization, etc to yeah to realize that we all want similar things when you deep down and that there's this illusion of separation and that's why participatory democracy for me is like really linked to like my spirituality or it's it's about uh psychological transformation or shifting consciousness in people to start collaborating with each other through dialogue rather than accepting dominion which is as extinction rebellions like clearly articulated dragging us to a collective fate that none of us want and we're just allowing it to happen because I don't know how to take control of my grassy verge you know? <laughs> I don't know how to fucking do it I don't it's so like like distant from me yeah yeah and in in like practical terms how does participatory democracy um work like how mm. would you, how, how do you go about setting that up within your community 
So the difference between, say, the XR approach and participatory democracy is that we want to get 100% of people all engaged in exercising these skills or practices that we think are so important. Um, and so to get people involved, you don't go to them and say, do you care about the climate crisis? Yes or no? If not, then why the fuck not? You should care about Because for a lot of people, like I've been living in Tottenham for the past nine months, people know about climate change, but the thing that like is affecting them on a day-to-day basis is systemic racism, oppression, classism, poverty, like, um, like crack issues, you know, all these things, litter on the street, whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm painting Tottenham really badly. Tottenham is a fucking beautiful place with really vibrant people who have a real sense of community. But they've, when you hear the stories of people and how they've tried to make change in their area, they're fighting against a lot, a lot of resistance that like you and me, Christopher, probably wouldn't face. Um, anyway, so when you go to speak to people, you don't say the climate is the number one issue. We're all at risk of blah, 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 blah. Um, that's such a privilege. Um, and so you go to people and say, hey, what are the issues affecting your community? What change would you like to see? And you start to find out what that is. So you do something called deep hanging out. And deep hanging out is like embedding yourself and really listening to what's going on in your area, identifying the people that are movers and shakers who are connected and embedded in their areas and whatnot. And not going in with your agenda other than to listen, learn and be of service to your area. Then you can move to something like a neighborhood or community assembly. So this is like the the place where people come together. And in Tottenham, we've been running them around the issue of Black Lives Matter, because that's been really pertinent. And bring people to discuss issues around that um, and find out what's relevant. So policing and stop and search policies relevant, education systems relevant, whatever, it comes through, you know, decolonized education system. And then you support that group to um, start working on those different areas. And it might be that you create a neighborhood support team um, to support young people being stopped and searched, or um, we want a place to gather that, um, like a community garden, so you might help people organize around that. Or we want to get our own counselors into power um, who are representatives of the people, not of parties. And so then you might look at flat pack democracy which is being launched now, Flatpak 2021, look at the website, um, and try and get your own councillors elected. Um, or you might turn to NVDA. You might say, well, we've been fighting this for ages. The Edmonton incinerator is going to be built. Um, we want to speak to people like Extinction Rebellion or Wretched of the Earth, or whoever, and, and do some NVDA. And but it's all focused around issues that people have identified themselves as being the issues that they care about rather than the issues that we believe we care about. And that's an important shift, I think, in, um, from Extinction Rebellion's approach to, I guess, the movement of movements approach. This is a bit more, it doesn't really matter for me. It doesn't really matter what issue it is. The climate's a big issue because loads of middle class people is the only major oppression or fear that they have until our children's futures at stake. We didn't give a fuck about the system because we were being served by it. Um, But now our children, God forbid, might be at risk. You know, it's like, oh, we better do something. But for so many other people, their lives are being threatened now and being affected now and they've been fucked by the system and there's so much energy so much rage so much love and power that can be galvanized if organized um to defeat the same system that is creating all these other oppressions like climate oppression or i think it's also acknowledging um like the like the importance of solidarity across movements so if it is like if you're it's a thing that you care about in your community is climate change and someone else has a different focus like you want to stand behind that person so that they can achieve their empowerment and 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 be heard and be listened to and supported yeah. because yeah, yeah. The more of us who are empowered and supported the more of us who are going to see alignment with each other and also understand that um you know most of the causes that you know people are 
activists for are, are, are and are fighting for are causes that are inherently about liberation of people and in that way there and, and of ecosystems and of just the, the living planet liberation of it from the systems which are causing oppression destruction and suffering um, and in that way all of our fights are interlinked and we must be supporting each other and hearing each other and um, I think that you know social media is wonderful for so many reasons and you know movements can spread really quickly you can really convey a lot of information in short bite-sized um, pieces but also we we're listening to people on the other side of the world that we stop listening to our own neighbors um, and we're mm. so wrapped up in, in in so many different issues that we kind of become completely disassociated from our from the place that we are actually connected to and I think that being involved well, I imagine because I actually am not at all and it's something that um uh, that I'm hoping to do when I settle back in London is to really start to be more engaged in my local community because I get burnout and sadness and overwhelm and anxiety because all my work feels so kind of internet focused and all the time I'm like I actually have no idea what I have achieved in the past six years I mean there's been moments of direct action but still you don't see that but if you were working with your community in order to create um, like a food growing co-op or you know help set up a community center or you'd be able to see the shift in the people in people on a daily basis you'd be able to see the mm -hmm. physical manifestation of the good work that the community has mm -hmm. done together and I think that is so powerful and 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 that it's that that I think is going to really change us and allow us to step up to like the bigger issues of, of climate change and and things. I mean, obviously, it's not an either or, but I I see them very much as um, interlinked. And um, mm. also interesting what you said about um, you know perhaps people would want to go down like the um, avenue of NVDA through participatory democracy, but also you can see participatory democracy as nonviolent direct action in the NVDA and civil disobedience is about creating a dilemma whereby the ruling elite or whatever you want to call it um, want have to pay attention to because suddenly you are um, obstructing their power flow um, or, mm. you're obstruct, or you're obstructing the growth of the economy if the community has come together and is successful in, in stopping something from going ahead. So, mm. And it's non-violent because you're, work, you're working with your community. So yeah, in, in that way, you can see that as, I think, non-violent direct action in and of itself. Yeah, totally. And like, it's about, uh, like, it's so hard not to just think of Rage Against the Machine, but it's about taking the power back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not through, like, going to them and pleading with them and saying, oh, give us power, give us power. It's like, we are going to just start doing what, and living and behaving in ways in which is our birthright, you know? Like, we should all be able to to work together in tribes, building our shelter, taking care of our environment, making decisions, et cetera, and finding better and better ways and collaborative ways of doing that. Um, there's, yeah, there's another element to it, which is, so dilemma actions. Uh, we set up a community garden in Tottenham. We didn't ask permission. We went and set it up. And people were like, oh, the council's going to like shut you down. And I was like, go on let them try because I was looking forward to like the dilemma of it like oh so this park which is derelict rundown the local community don't go to anymore because people only go there for their dogs to shit and for and lots of crack users and heroin users use the park so the local kids in the estate don't go there anymore we cleaned up a section of it um and set it up if someone came and tried to say no you should shut that down like we'd have taken them to town um, it's a dilemma action for them. And then it says, okay, why are you not letting more people do this? And the other is spaces, like people in our, um, in our community circle, they want a community centre. There's not enough community centres. And there are two and a half empty commercial buildings for every homeless person in London. So we have started squatting empty buildings and trying to turn them into um, community centers and we need more people to be doing that. And that's another civil, civilly disobedient um, form of constructive dilemma like action. You know, this is in service of the community. It's meeting their needs in a way in which the powers that be aren't meeting them. 
um, and it's allowing us to gather and start working on the things like climate emergency centers, deep adaptation, or whatever the issues the local community decides upon. There's a lot of squatting that happens, but it's not um, in service of the locality as much as we'd like it to be. And we can shift that kind of in, in different ways. So there's many different ways in which rebellion or um, NVDA can kind of happen or take place. Mm, definitely. And I think I was thinking about, you, so go on. No, you go. Uh, just like, yeah, Julian was talking to me the other day um, and he was telling me about the belonging contribution circle. Like, I think like young people, young professionals or young educated people like myself are like a scourge on the city. Um, we are like so complicit in the destruction and dismantling of communities. And I think it's something which we all need to own and accept. Like we are like a huge gentrifying force, no matter how woke we think we are like and we're not to blame like the karmic impulses like come from you know far beyond us but we're definitely complicit in it and we move around you know we just move around from place to place and part of that moving around is because we feel no sense of belonging in our area and julian was saying we don't feel a sense of belonging because we're not contributing anything to an area and when you contribute to an area it's not just that you see other people benefiting but you see the transformation in yourself and you start feeling the sense of connection and belonging mm. to a site to a people to a place not to an idea like my senses of belonging are to like you because we're yogis right um not to you because we lived next door to each other and we like have looked after our grassy verges for the past two years <laughs> uh, <laughs> so as we belong more we're then more willing to contribute more and then we belong more and we contribute more and you no longer have these like these destructive gentrifying migrants who don't give a fuck about their area just go and set up new like whatever places we go and hang out in that are exclusive to people that are local yeah um I and see, then move on in a couple of years i see like connection belonging and purpose as some kind of holy trinity yeah. um yeah, yeah, that yeah we must all be trying to strive for and, and trying to yeah. kind of um, support our friends and family and communities in, in, in getting to that place because when we contribute positively to the world around us, we see it, we see you know, other people benefiting, but also we acknowledge the fact that there is something within us that is positive, like that, we, that we're, we have a unique gift that we can offer to the world. And I think that yeah, yeah. Um, because of the value system which we're born into and, and which becomes a part of us, so we so often feel like we don't have anything to offer the world because we don't, we're not subscribing to and we don't take the boxes of, of, of what so much of culture seems to be valuing. Um, and I think that, that be empowering communities and, and people to start to organize themselves to understand democracy as a value in and of itself it's 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 like freedom is a value like it's it's yeah. innately part of 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 human nature to to participate to be active in life to to be curious to 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 want to collaborate and be with each other to 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 work for what's best for 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 the for the greater good and i genuinely believe that to be human nature and i think we need to be kind of bringing awareness to the fact that um, democracy shouldn't necessarily be seen as like a privilege, but it's something that we are constantly having to hold others accountable for and like constantly striving for because we have not reached a democratic kind of utopia. <laughs> and I don't think we ever will. I think we'll, there will always mm. be some people who are power grabbing. So there needs to be other people redistributing, um, re mm. redistributing the power and, and allowing people to, to be engaged in, in a meaningful way in, in their local communities and, and larger nation as well. Yeah. And that, yeah, I fucking agree with that so much. Like purpose is really fundamental to me. And like, I think going to Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a really great place to kind of help people find purpose. Like What's that? Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like, uh, it's like a pyramid structure. And it's like, I think the bottom is like, we need food, shelter, water. Um, then once those are addressed, then, oh, and safety. Once those are addressed, we then have like 
human connection or like social like needs and stuff like that and then once those are addressed we then have like self-actualization realization creativity art etc um and a, a one way of giving people purpose is to allow them to have control over different elements of their hierarchy of needs so you don't need to go to these like abstract like how can we give people meaning and purpose oh they'll have to do all these like lofty join religions and whatnot actually give them control over um things that they've been hardwired we've been hardwired to find purpose and meaning through you know yeah. um i think there's similar to touch on was fucking loads of shit you're opening up so one is like so participatory democracy isn't just about um Mm. Okay, so it serves a climate crisis in a couple of different ways. One, um, people can start making decisions and taking power back in their local area and making small decisions that are beneficial. But then I hear my Extinction Rebellion voice screaming at me going, oh, but we need like national policy change. We need the government to shift. We need corporations to shift, etc." And you could say like, yeah, but as people generate more dialogue and more connection and support from each other, um in a more authentically communal way uh, or human way rather than gaining it from like corporations and and things that the government's trying to sell then people are more likely to adopt more courageous ways of living and decision making so you get a shift in consciousness mm. I but just want to add, add to that also, though, that it's I think we so often see things as like an either or. So it's like either yeah, we have yeah, like the yeah. hard, fast work of XR or we have the slower kind of longer term community organizing. And, and the dream is that we have organizations like XR who are doing that like sharp, hard, fast work of like change, change your policies. And then we have yeah. other community building things that are working on a deeper, more resilient um, manner not the xr is in the yeah, but you know what i mean so yeah. continue <laughs> then like the second tier of that is um communities community um not community citizens assemblies um so we want a citizens assembly because that will take power away from these like conditioned politicians who we don't blame and shame but who have been conditioned to behave and work in a certain way, which is old paradigm politics, patriarchal, competitive, um, you know, paying homage to their donors and whoever they were educated with. So we want to give ordinary people um, uh, decision-making power. But citizens' assembly is still a top-down approach. You still got a group of people that are going to make a set of policy decisions um, that then everyone needs to adopt and there's gonna be loads of people that are like well fuck that <laughs> like no i'm still gonna live my life the way that i'm doing it so you need that like you need citizens assemblies happening at every single level of society which is essentially the tier from localized participatory democracy at the neighborhood level talking about your grassy verges all the way up to the national and international citizens assemblies mm -hmm. so without participatory democracy a citizen assembly, in my opinion, will not be able to affect the change it needs. Also, it's going to take a fucking year for them to figure out their shit. I mean, I really believe in citizen assemblies, don't get me wrong, but it's going to take a year for that to sort itself out. Then however long for the government institutions to then change their policies, etc. Like, it's just all too slow. Yeah. You know? um, and ideally, it needs to be like televised for there to be like a consciousness shift. It needs to be televised and prioritized in the news and in all like soap operas. They should be playing clips from it and stuff so that everyone's taken on the journey that the people in the citizen assemblies go on. Mm -hmm. Because they, through dialogue and communication, are entering with opposing opinions and then coming to an integrated approach. And that's self-transformative, but we need everyone to transform and be on that journey. So it's unlikely that it's gonna be televised, but everyone can have their own soap opera in their own neighborhood through their own um, democratic processes in their neighborhoods. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think I can hear myself and maybe others thinking, that's way too complex. It would never work to have so many different like layers of decision-making. 
But then if you think about like how complex our food system is, how many yeah. different ingredients go into each thing and it's all managed to like be packaged up and comes to the supermarket or whatever shop you go to. And I think that, I think that like I'm obsessed with um, complexity and like really wanting to like embrace complexity and nuance and like stop trying to think like, I, I think that uh, the, the inability for our governing systems to adapt and to mm. change and our economic system to change according to the reality in which we live in is the fundamental issue at, at root. It's in, you know, in the same thing within us as well. It's like our fear of change or inability to adapt, to, to alter our behavioral patterns in order to um, bring about less suffering for ourselves and others. Like, I, I think that, that we need to try and move away from um, trying to have these very clean, rigid ways of decision making because it's just not natural. Like everything yeah, in life not. is so complex. <laughs> yeah. It's so complex yeah. and it's so beautiful and it flourishes in, in, in its yeah. way. And, and I think that it's the, the top down control means that everything needs to be by the book. But actually, if we had more trust in each other and in process, then we'd be able to have more emergent forms of, of participatory democracy and engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And like we gain so much from it. Like it's not just about the decisions. It's about like. It's about connecting to people in a way in which you've not connected to them before. And like, you know arguably you and I are doing the things we're doing because we felt this like deep lack of connection to meaning, purpose, people, planet, whatever. And we're like, fuck, that's not good enough. I, I'm, I'm going to cast aside the narratives that I've been given and try and find something that is really meaningful. And um, I had two like stories that have come through the community democracy kind of circles even running around Black Lives Matter. Mm. One is that one of my like kind of resolutions was I realized how deeply racist I am because when I walk through the streets of Tottenham or wherever, I like, I see a group of young black people and I look away or like don't smile at them or whatever. And if they say, say anything to me, I just kind of like fob it off or something. And I just made the decision to start like looking at people and just saying, hi, how's it going? You all right? And it's fucking mad. Like I just have this assumption that like this person's going to be like, aggressive or pissed off with me and people say oh, I'm right bro you good and I'm like yeah yeah I'm fine I didn't expect that to happen you know um and it's it's tragic how like surprised I am every time people are just really fucking nice because it shows how deeply racist and how much afrophobia there is in me but I was asked by someone in our community circles uh, Rose who's like an incredible community organizer in um Tottenham she was like so now that you're doing that how do you feel? Because I feel like it's my gift to them, right? I'm paying them attention and helping them feel valued and respected. She's like, how do you feel? And I was like, I feel light and free. And I walk down the street and I feel no fear. I feel connected. I like can look at anyone and smile at anyone and it feels fucking good. I feel that sense of belonging. I feel like I'm there with them. And now I have like loads of friends. I like my relationships with people distant from me are failing because I have so many people I know in on my street, you know, well, not now that I've moved to Camden, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> it's heartbreaking. And the other story is like, um, uh, I'll call her Grace. Her name's not Grace. So a Nigerian woman came to one of our circles in Hackney and uh, she lived in London for 12 years. Um, you know, English isn't great, she's got three kids. And the question we were asking the community circle was, in the six weeks since George Floyd died, what changes have you seen um, around racial justice? And she was like, for the first time that I've lived here, um, people look at me and they smile at me. And for the first time, I feel safe and free to express myself. I was like, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. Like just through people smiling and saying hi, this incredible human being is free to express themselves. And Grace has 
unfathomable gifts to give society, but they've been caged by our like atomization and fear and separation. And now she's like, who the fuck knows what Grace can do, you know? But now it's like, it's there, it's open and people can support her, like look after her kids while she goes and splurges on her local environment. And it's because like young hipsters like me who are scared of black people because we've been told to be, are now smiling, you know, it's fucking amazing. So we have everything to gain now not just once we get this democratic complex system and decisions are made about our grassy verges, it's from now. And this leads me to the third element where I want you to talk about, which is, it's not about, how to put it? There are things happening that we can't control. And there's two wings of this. It's one is the like um, over mechanization of industries such that unemployment is becoming massive yeah. And employment was this like bullshit we were handed to take our, to subvert our calling for meaning and purpose, right? Oh, you got a job in this meaningless industry, but that's your purpose. And now you can support your family unit, blah, 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 blah. The other is like that we aren't stopping climate, the climate from collapsing. There is social collapse in our midst and unfolding at the moment in the UK, in America, and already like far down the line in other countries. And we need to be adapting to that. So deep adaptation, urban deep adaptation. Yeah. So that's not about like sorting out your climate grief and like, you know, people got this like stereotype of people then going off to Thailand to like, mooch around on the permaculture farm while the world collapses around them. But I think that's like doing an injustice to deep adaptation as long as deep adaptation communities start to engage in urban deep adaptation, yeah. um, which yeah. is about making sure that as the systems collapse around us, we won't have a hierarchical system to support us, right? That will be null and void when the corporate systems that support those uh, the democratic system decides actually we don't want a democratic system we actually want a fascist regime a totalitarian regime or the whole system collapses and there aren't even corporations so we need people that are able to go we know how to work together we know how to collaborate and work and bring us into an empowered position but we can not just deal with our grassy verges, but deal with a sustainable food system within our own environment. And that people will turn in the face of that collapse, when they're afraid, they'll turn to love and freedom and funk. And away from control and violence. Yeah. And that is the choice that people will be faced with. Yeah. And through participatory democracy, community democracy, we're exercising that skill. It's a training ground now before things get too bad. And that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. More than thank any of the other things. Thank you. Um, there's so much in what you just said that I'd like to um, respond to, but just a few things is that I love your story of, um, of Grace and I love your own personal story as well. Um, but it's that like between the two of them, it's like, kind of like highlights the power of feeling heard and like really feeling seen um yeah. and 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 like I guess that links with how participatory democracy can help heal those deep wounds of of being so ignored by your neighbors and like to the point of sh like it must feel sh like almost ashamed because why would <laughs> why would people not look at you and smile like it's and then how we internalize those and then create um uh modes in, in order to to cope with that um so i i love how how that links back with participatory oh my god the word participatory <laughs> democracy yeah, yeah. As, community uh, democracy is easier <laughs> and some kind of uh community democracy that's good yeah that some works kind yeah. of some kind of like healing um healing to that and uh and yeah the and then obviously the next thing is is on resilience and human resilience and um us trying to shift out of this crisis response to crisis because yes we are facing a crisis and we need fast action 
and we need it very soon. Um, but that also with that, we need to be shifting out of the crisis response because what occurs with that is the um, regurgitation of the same the same systems which have brought about the, the crises in, in the first place. Um, and so I think that when whenever we're engaging in nonviolent direct action in order to um, dismantle the system, what are we doing on the other side of, of our action in order to, to support and bolster and, and give nourishment to something? And that might be in um, like in our like relationship with ourselves and our relationship with others and our relationship with our um, with our natural environments. It might be about alternative economies, alternative food systems. You know, they shouldn't be called alternative, but they are to the mm. mainstream. Um, and 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 seeing that as like the the kind of flip side because if we're constantly focusing on tearing stuff down, fighting against stuff, feeling panicked and freaked out by the climate crisis, we're not going to sustain ourselves, and we're not going to be able to face the 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 circumstances which are definitely coming our way the inevitable um things which are going to come our way um so yeah so thank you a lot for for bringing up the the resilience aspect of nvda and and democracy i think it's more than resilience like because i started laughing because i was like what is the point of all of it like why are we doing this right and like there's this mistake which is that we're doing it in order to stop the climate from breaking down yeah actually like nothing's changed like the point of all of it is for us to flourish yeah. it's for us to realize our true funky like nature to like love each other feel connected feel purposeful etc and we've just got this survival pressure of you know climate breakdown that is forcing an accelerated evolution um and that's why we're here and that's um, yeah that's what it's really about for me like, i love i love that i love that because also it's like if you have like the privilege like like everything in this world like changes and we have like no control over over so much but like we do have control over the, the actions that we take and the effects of those actions. So yeah. regardless of what's happening on the huge big scale of climate change and, and like political fragmentation and social fragmentation, like what if like your daily actions can contribute to like, to the human flourishing of potential, as you said at the beginning and, and to, to, to harmonizing with natural systems and cultivating a life of more joy and, and by that also more joy for others. Like, like that for me is what um, activism is about. It's not some tag on to the end of your week that you do a bit of this or a bit of that. It's like as much as possible to embody that, to, to that process like in the Bhagavad Gita, which we've spoken about before, is like creating harmony where disharmony has occurred. Like it's, it's yes, it's the climate crisis, but it's also like your relationship with, um, not yours, like my relationship with my dad or um, that, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's it's in it's in everything, and I think the the more that we attach to these end results and we focus on these big crises, the more that we forget why it is we're actually doing what we're doing, yeah, and yeah. also we yeah. become just disillusioned and and probably just give up. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I do not give a flying fuck about the perpetuation of the human species. Like, if we're like just trying to keep ourselves going for longer, like I'm out. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I'm down for. It's for like creating like a yeah beautiful existence for us all, and there's so much potential. Um, but unfortunately, there's very little that a government policy decision can make to help people realize like yeah their divine nature or the beauty of everything. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't taught how to fathom beauty, you know, like there I. There are a few experiences in my upbringing where I was like brought to something beautiful and encouraged to admire it, you know, and I've had to teach myself that. And for me, that's like as much of an intervention in the face of collapse, like being at the community garden and like sharing some beauty that I'm observing with some of the young people that come. That's for me as much of an intervention in the midst of societal collapse as 
trying to change our energy system or something like that because and I think we should all be engaging at that level it's just it's scary it's really fucking scary because like the separation is so deep like I'm someone who's quite outgoing and quite good at talking to people but it's hard just to strike up conversation with like random um I don't know the random Kurdish people in uh, Wood Green or in on Green Lanes or whatever in North London. It's, it's hard. We've just been told that, oh, no, you won't get on. There's nothing to talk about. Da, 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 da. Mm. So I understand the difficulty that people face like in this area. But for me, it's the, yeah, we're, we're reclaiming something that is our birthright, like mm. a way of living that is so connected and so joyful um and then when we get to that point no one will give a fuck whether we whether things collapse or not because a it's happening anyway so you can't stop it but b we'll have each other we'll genuinely have each other um yeah i think like so much of this as well i think it's there's a fear but also like we lack collective visions for the post like i I don't think many of us can imagine what it would be like to live in a community that was that engaged and that connected and that supportive of each other, that it's almost like a dream. But I think when we can start to, to envision that and to talk to other people in your community about the possibility that together we might be able to, to co-create something similar to that vision, yeah. then that's yeah. when things can actually start to happen. And I remember in the community democracy uh, workshop or talk that, um i was at with you um that it was like oh my god like this is so exciting i didn't know this was possible why didn't i not know about this before How, <laughs> yeah. like what have i been doing why did why did i do this i mean i still haven't done it but you know i guess i'm focusing on other things at this moment in time but it you are is, doing it you brought me on the call in it yeah well but you know it's just there's just a major lack of vision um and that's something I think we're going to be really focusing on in on from now because, like, um, we had we did an interview with Richard Louv and he was kind of coined the term nature deficit disorder and he said that um, a lot of children that he speaks to when he asks them what the future looks like they kind of paint a picture like Mad Max or The Matrix or you know something like this or something really dystopian um, mm. and if you wake up every morning kind of thinking that the future is going to look like that, thinking that the reality that's, that we live in is the only possible reality that we could be functioning in, how are we going to kind of get, pluck up the courage to start to organize with, to organize ourselves, organize with our community, start to take action in whatever form that that is, it, depending on where you probably are in the world. Um, and I think this is like a really important piece of the puzzle that we're missing is like how can we foster collective visions to mm. know that like another way is possible and of course it is because the state that we're living in now has mm. is, is actually a very new state you know the, the ways that things are functioning has only kind of been evolved over the past 50 years kind of since mm. the second world war i mean obviously there's longer way longer term issues but <laughs> and and it's, and it's exactly that like you said the word co-creation and like collective visioning and stuff like how do you do that first you need connection with people around you then you need spaces where you go together where it's normalized that you vision your future and you do that like outside of school like where do you gather with random people in your area like pubs maybe like this fucking jack shit especially with covid Nothing. lockdown yeah it's like covid such a counter-revolutionary force which is why like i'm committing myself now to being part of a um a squat crew a squat network where we're trying to squat um commercial properties and turn them into community centers for people to gather and do that visioning for their own area mm. and be empowered to do these things we need spaces to gather vision collectivize co-create our future and without that space to gather like we it's just not possible mm. and like yeah if people are interested in how to do that like we we're happy to support people because you can also without squatting the building you can get permission from the commercial landlords of the building to give you their property for a period of time and we, yeah just need like a couple of thousand of those and the revolution is ours yeah you know, <laughs> stuff, which is exactly why we're not allowed to do it <laughs> <laughs> so how can um 
how can people get in touch or what would be um like are there any resources or websites or or things that you would want to direct anyone listening to this who would like to take some next steps uh come visit us at our squat the cave <laughs> in the magic dharma temple um <laughs> Uh, Flatpak Democracy 2021. Yeah, so Flatpak Democracy 2021. Then the Trust the People program that um, the Trust the People team are doing, which is like a training program for people to um, do all the levels of the kind of participatory democracy kind of level, the program, and really helps people to. Yeah, it's fucking great. It's an amazing program. It's like five weeks long. They did one version already, they've got another one coming up. Um, the other thing is to look at like tra um, the work of Dominic Barter and like um, transformative justice systems and um, what are they called? I can't remember. And there's a book called uh, Something Cities, Fearless Cities, um, about the municipal movement. And they talk about like six different areas um, where they've had like successful kind of taking over of local councils. The other thing you can do is mm, kind of reticent to say this, but like I recently got a Twitter account. <laughs> uh, uh, it's Dr. Vish 462. Um, 46 and 2 is an amazing song by Tool about the evolution of consciousness, which is really important for people to listen to. But anyway, at Dr. Vish 462, and um, we'll start putting up like information resources. And then if you want to join our squatting collective um, or find out more about it, you can email um, duck it, like the duck, duck it at protonmail.ch. Um, but maybe, Chris, I can just send you like some resources. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. And just put them out. Because like, yeah, we're at the stage now where we like, we've got some pretty good models that need to be shared. And it's like, it's like how do you keep the rebellion going in between these rebellions? Yeah. And this is probably the one bit, I know we've, like, we've talked for fucking ages. Thank you so much for the time. Um, Thank you. But the, just a really tiny, massive final bit like that was missed is that um, one thing that is persistently omitted from XR's theory of change, which follows momentum-based organizing. Um, it's like, I think my like second or third um, value and principle. Um, yeah, there's an element which is omitted from momentum driven organizing um, and so momentum driven organizing the kind of textbook on that is this is an uprising by the Engler brothers and they look at they examine civil disobedient movements throughout history and they and you know when you read that you're saying like oh whoa this is why XR does things the way XR does things you know but momentum driven organizing has two wings. One is slow, broad based community organizing. And the other is these actions that create these whirlwind moments where everyone rises up and starts doing stuff. And there's, you know, the criticism of the slow organizing is that it's fucking slow. Um, but the criticism of whirlwind organizing is that you can only galvanize people together um, if they feel connected to each other. So you need both. And yeah. if you look at the civil, right, civil rights movement in um, America, in India, in like um, Latin American countries, there have been revolutions in Serbia with Oppo. You know, in, in America, they, they, they had the church and the church was the unifying force that brought these communities together. And it means that at the moment, when we carry out a sacrificial act through arrest or putting our liberty on the line with Extinction Rebellion, we're relying on the media and our very small networks to spread that message. Whereas if you had deeply connected entrenched communities that transcended cultural divides and went to like, you know, everyone in your local area knew you and imagine you get arrested and when, and so many more people know about it and they're willing to step up, not because they read about, they happen to read about it in a newspaper, which happens to report it favorably. Um, and so then they step up, you know, it's too dilute. Instead they step up because fuck, that's Christabel and she's doing this because she cares about an issue that I care about. 
I'm going to go out because there's no way that Christopher is going to be treated like that. I'm going to step up. It's, it's that depth of connection. It's the human strength of connection that will drive our rev revolution and that will drive people to come out onto the streets in millions to overthrow this system. Mm. Without that broad-based, slow connection, authentic-based like organizing, we rely on the, the fucked up mechanisms of proxy connection through social media and through the media, which doesn't communicate the depth of that connection we have if we're friends who belong to the same community in the same geographical area. So I, you know, I don't think that like we can get the numbers we need unless we have something like this at a local level. By this, I mean like participatory democracy, community organizing, or just fuck the community organizing, just community, you know, yeah. just community. Yeah. So, yeah. Vishal, kind of thank you. Them, but, yeah. Well, no, thank you so much. And um, I think that's a really beautiful um, place to draw the interview to an end, because I know I could continue asking you loads of questions and yeah, talking loads myself. Um, but yeah, just remembering the power of social cohesion and bringing communities together. Um, and like you say, you know, if the idea of setting up a kind of community democracy, participatory democracy um, feels over <laughs> overwhelming at this point, smile to the people who walk past you and um, yes. engage yeah. with the people from the shop who um, and the pubs and, and from the kind of the more static places in the community who know more of the community, who hear the conversations and start to be more integrated in that way. Um, yeah, 100% because that's such a you know that's such a powerful piece and you know it's definitely not going to be carbon trading that's going to save us all <laughs> yeah that's, it. that's the eco resolution right the eco resolution is just start smiling and looking at and striking up natural conversation with people <laughs> in your area and it's incredible it will take weeks if not months but just those smiles and those hellos build up the foundation for trust and more conversation and then organizing and then revolution. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Michelle.